This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Hans Schiemann and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Thanks for having my back, Hans, and I hope we'll get to see you at an upcoming competition with Plastic Weekly stickers all over that water bottle. Before we get into today's episode, I got to make sure you know that this Saturday, January 13th, I'll be live streaming the finals of Blockbuster on YouTube. It's a bouldering competition, which I know you love, and it's on YouTube, which I know you use every day already. So on Saturday, tune in at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. It's on the Climbers Rock official channel. And hang out with me and Dustin Curtis in the chat. I'll post a link on the website or just search Climbers Rock on YouTube and subscribe to the Orange and Black CR to get notified of when we go live. Keeping with the comp theme, today's episode is all about a competition series that came out of nowhere. A few years ago, the UBS appeared and showed us all a different way of running a comp series, how to coordinate with gyms, and how to put on a dope team finals. I'm talking about the University Bouldering Series, of course. So get to your desk, get out your notepad, and prepare to get learned. Max Summerly talking to me right now from just probably a few blocks away in Toronto. How are you doing on this Sunday, Max? I am great, Tyler. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. I'm keeping warm, um, getting over a bit of a cold, but you know, that's just what happens these days. So can't complain. Time of the year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we've spoken before, you know, just uh, in chats talking about the industry in general, uh, but there's a lot of things to talk to you about specifically, and I'm really glad we finally get this chance to. Uh, and one of the big ones, aside from your you know, history with a lot of Canadian gyms, is that you were part of a team that created uh, the University Bouldering Series here in Canada, um, which I think will be best known to Ontario climbers. Um, but uh, there's probably some awareness uh, across the country and maybe some people in the States have heard about it or even competed in it. So the UBS, you know, was a big thing over the last couple of years, not so much now, but um, as I'll kind of get to, there's some changes in the Canadian scene. So I wanted to talk. And uh, anyway, the first question I think we should start with is just, uh, you know, what was or what is the University Bouldering Series? The University Bowling Series, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, it really, it started as an idea. I was, I just started a job as the general manager of the Guelph Grotto, my home gym. And there's a group of students from the University of Guelph Climbing Club, which was incredibly active when I was managing. And they approached me and said, hey, we want to host a competition for our climbers at your facility. Are you interested? And me <laughs> always wanting to do uh, more than I really should. I said, well, why would we do it for just you? Let's invite everybody uh, and see where we can go from there. So I started working with uh, David Albert Lebrun and uh, Ali Sutherland, uh, who were then the presidents of the University of Guelph Climbing Club. We got together and we started thinking about what a competition would look like, a university competition would look like. And I think the really important thing to us was if we're going to create a competition series that was going to be surrounding at least varsity or intramural or collegiate athletes, we wanted it to mean something more than just individual places. So this was about school spirit. This was about community. This was about encouraging people to cheer each other along, which I think is for a lot of people, their experience of climbing anyway. It is a very community oriented sport, even in the competition scene. But uh, our goal was to have something where you could compete individually as an athlete, but also your score uh, mattered to your team and your standing. Um, in that comp, it was just a one-off. That's how we planned it. And we, uh, believe it or not, actually planned it to have a sleepover uh, ending the competition at the climbing gym, uh, which for anybody planning climbing competitions, I highly recommend not doing. It was, <laughs> it, honestly, it was a lot of fun, but it was far too much work. And when you spend weeks leading up to a competition, making sure everything's right, the last thing you want to do is have a sleepover at the gym and babysit a bunch of uh, university students. Um, but, you know, that's where it started. And and it was honestly, we decided to do caps. I think we did categories. And we capped the amount of people per category. And honestly, every day we just had to keep increasing the amount of people. And I think we ended up, which was a rare thing, we ended up at about 150 people for our first competition. 
Um, and it was awesome. 150 people from 17 different colleges and universities across Ontario. Um, we even had somebody who is in town from maybe Nova Scotia uh, compete as well. So, I mean, it was a really cool start. And all of a sudden, there seemed like there was just a need to do more than a one-off comp. And that's really where the series as itself started. Okay, so some context for for this, because anybody listening from the United States, uh, the U.S. has the massive USA Climbing Collegiate Series. Um, In Canada at that time, there wasn't a history of collegiate competitive climbing, right? You talked about the Guelph, uh, sorry, the University of Guelph Climbing Club. It wasn't a competitive body, like they. Not really, no, no, and and that was, I mean, when I started climbing, I competed in a high school competition series but really there wasn't a sustained like series of i'm sure local gyms had one-off comps here and there but not a series that really engaged students from multiple universities to come out and compete as a team and that's that was our goal so you did this comp once and as you kept going the like the purpose of these university climbing clubs started to change i remember having uh, organ, um, like presidents of these university climbing clubs talking to us as gym runners about like, how do you coach a team? What kind of drills do you do? How do you organize a schedule? And it was kind of all at once. And, and this UBS was kind of a catalyst for this. Um, did you expect it to change the nature of like university climbing clubs as quickly as it did? I no, not at all. <laughs> I think that was just kind of, um, uh, a happy accident um, and it was really interesting I definitely there are some very active climbing clubs and I don't think people really got a taste of how involved they were until there was this opportunity for them to start organizing and rallying around something and I do remember like very specifically the McMaster Climbing Club and and the Queen's uh, Climbing Club making huge efforts. They trained together, they traveled and practiced together. And that was not what we expected because that just that thing didn't exist. We just kind of wanted people to come together and have some fun and and enjoy themselves as a team as well as individuals. So that was uh, a happy accident, I would say. So you you talked about running one event and it was only supposed to be a one-off. It was a huge success. How did you guys plan the growth from there on out? I would like to say that we planned it. (laughs) Um, It honestly, it was uh, far more organic, I think, than we ever wanted it to be. It, it, It would just kept being more and more. And so we were always at this state of kind of playing catch up and saying, you know, all of a sudden we need, you know, our comps are going to be 200 people. We even had close to 250 register for a comp once. Never expected it to be like that, but I think it grew because of the community support. I'm pretty sure we had the guys at Grand River approach us and say, hey, we want to host a comp, and that's where we ended up next after the grotto. Because the grotto was easy. It was home gym for me. It felt safe. It was a good place to start. And then we kind of branched out there from the connections that I had and that we had in the community. And um, it really, it just, it took off. And all of a sudden, it wasn't one comp. It we it snowballed into whatever we ended up, 15, something like that at the end of it. And um, I really hope it's not actually the end of it. It's just in a different phase or state right now so you talk about it being fairly organic but there was a point where uh every you know whether or not it was organized very well in the background the outward facing material that you guys were putting out the promo stuff the marketing materials was like super super legit a really tight (laughs) op uh, and honestly, it looked like one of the cleanest, like best organized comp series uh, that like Canada had ever seen at that point. Um, uh, the vivid memory I had was when we went to host our first event at Climbers Rock, which I think was uh, the uh, if it was fall of twenty thirteen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you guys had this uh, PDF that you could get from the website that walked you through all of the processes. Mm-hmm. And us at CR, we had hosted a ton of comps. This was going to be easy and a ton of fun. But I remember thinking like, man, any gym could host this. You could be like a, you know, a tiny little, you know, backwater facility with no experience with comps. And you guys were very clearly walking through the logistics of it. Like how many staff you recommend to have at the registration station, at the waiver station, at the, <laughs> at the um, like t-shirt 
spirit pickup station. You broke yeah. down all the rules and how to kind of like streamline the flow based on the setting. Uh, you had everything pre-made, obviously stuff like scorecards and, uh, and problem numbers, but also signage for all of those, you know, registration stations. Every, it was like so well done. And at that point, all I was thinking was, you know, this is, is going to be a huge thing. There's no way this will ever stop. This is just <laughs> so well done. I'm psyched. So you're talking about how it was fairly inorganic, but at some point you guys decided let's clean this thing up and make it like a, a sick product. Yeah, we did. I mean, we rallied after we saw how successful that first comp was. Uh, the three of us kind of sat down and said, well, why was this successful? Why are certain competitions lacking certain things? What can we do? What can we add in? And it wasn't, it was not like reactionary to anything. It was just like, Hey, there's comps that exist. What can we do to, to improve on that process? And my, one of my first experiences as a manager was actually running a tour de block. So I started managing the grotto in 2010 and the grotto hosted a tour de block for the first time. And I think honestly, five, years um, but coming into this management situation and running a tour de block it was kind of like standing on a train track and just staring at this oncoming train being like I don't know what I'm doing or how to deal with this and part of me I actually came from I come from a, an academic background and I just actually spent a lot of time creating basically pedagogical exercises to lead students through so it was like a handout this is your pdf for how you do it and it also was accompanied by uh, an instructor one as well and so that's where we thought about it if you're going to be hosting a comp wouldn't it be really nice if everything was done for you and that all you do is let your setters have fun um you know they play around on the walls and and all the organization is done by somebody coming into your gym because also managing managing a gym i realized the exponential costs of hosting a competition i mean you're shutting down your gym for setting you're shutting it down for regular business and you're hoping to compensate that with partial competition fees so we wanted to make that impact on a gym easier and you're right we did create this incredible document and and looking back at it now it's really cool to see where it was because the hope was that you'd get this and you should just be able to run through it we were very lucky to in the initial stages partner with somebody who had some incredible design for us i think we honestly really lucked out with that um matthew christorfen did amazing work for us and went on to do some work for the hive as well uh, he was a climber and a designer and he knew what we were what that competition series really needed it needed a fun face and a clean look so that it was easy it was like this one two three and you're and you go with it and for the most part that really did work um with the new gyms when we hosted it with them um but I think, you know, later on is where the, like, we created those packages, but what we didn't create was actually a business plan is how do we make a competition series and make it last and, and, and run. And so we were always kind of just playing catch up in that sense. And so the front, yeah, I think it looked great and we did a really good job engaging with people. Um, and the back ends, it, it was all volunteer work. We were doing this out of the goodness of wanting to see these athletes come together and have a good time. So I think at some point an organization like that, if it's it's entirely volunteer run can have its downfalls for sure. At the start of that answer, you mentioned that you were trying to figure out uh, what made, uh, you know, a comp successful and what metrics were you using at that time uh, to gauge success? I know for me, my biggest thing is like how many people show up. Um, what, what, uh, what kind of things got you excited to see and made you feel like things were working out or not? Um, the comps themselves, when we got people out, honestly, to get people out to the first comp was a huge success, to get more people out to the next competition, uh, and then just kept growing from there. And it, we, you may remember at a point, we just kept like having to increase the amount of people. I think one year at Climbers Rock, we bumped registration to 250 and we had 214 or something show up to the comp. Um, but then it was the, the constantly asking from people when's the next comp when are we going to do more and then gyms all of a sudden starting to reach out to us you mentioned that a lot of gyms would come to you asking when you could host another comp and uh, mm -hmm. a question i see online is a lot of people that run gyms uh you know wherever they may be asking how do i start a, a comp how do i get other gyms involved why was the ubs thing so attractive for other gyms to try and become a part of 
I think a lot of that came from the students actually bugging gyms and asking them about it because when it happened once, I think they wanted to see it happen again. And the question was, well, if it can happen at the Grotto or it can happen at Grand River, why can't it happen here? And so I think there was definitely pressure from students um, to these gyms to get them to engage with us. And at a point, I think it was our relationship that we created with gyms as well that had them coming back to us because we sent in a team that took care of everything. We were volunteer run, myself and my wife and a few other people really put a lot of time into it. And that's what we wanted to do is we want to have that positive experience so that a gym would come back to us and say, let's host this and do it again. But initially, for sure, that was students. Is there something different about hosting a comp for this demographic uh, that changes how you operationally run a competition uh, compared to, you know, a tour de bloc where it's a fully public, any age, any difficulty, comparing it to a straight up youth comp? What, uh, What are like the hallmarks of organizing a comp for university students? Well, I mean, it's interesting you ask that because we had no idea when we started. Um, and, and one of the things was, is when you look at the creation of a competition series, um, you think about who you're creating it for. And I'm saying that in context of when I set a competition, I want to know the field of athletes that I'm setting for. So when you start a competition series, you have no idea who you're creating it for. And so we had to create a competition series. And our probably that first comp of the Grotto had a crazy range of, of climbs and abilities. We had no idea what people were going to come. But our mandate was, let's make it as easy as possible so that our easiest problem, like anybody can do and we had people renting climbing shoes at almost every comp that we had because they hadn't climbed before so i think it was interesting because we 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 created and grew with this setup and this um uh, this market, we didn't know what they wanted, but by the end of it, we were able to understand what, where the ability levels are. And I mean, I don't think it was too much different hosting a youth comp versus a university one in that you still want to break down categories. You still want to make sure that you're not getting that bottleneck in a certain place. But, um, uh, I mean, one thing is you just don't have to deal with parents. All you deal with is forgetful <laughs> students, um, students that don't remember their student cards or forget to show up to a comp or things like that. But um, for the most part, yeah, it was, they were actively engaged in our – we used to start with just show up and pay on the day of. And we'd have a pretty big attrition rate. And then we moved to having people actually have a, like, make a deposit or pay ahead of time. And that was a really interesting change in it as well as we saw – a higher in engagement with people when we were making them have a commitment to us. So we learned a lot of things. We definitely learned a lot of things over the four years that we were running that competition. I got to say for me, I only set for one of the UBSs that Climbers Rock hosted, but I, I like when we started it, you came to us and you said, you know, set easier than you think. Um, make sure you've got more, more options for people down at that beginner level. But mm-hmm. the, the beauty of, of the UBS was, unlike a tour de bloc, I didn't have to think about the extremes of setting for tiny kids, right? Mm-hmm. So we yeah. got to have so much fun. We probably set like 50, 50 to 60 problems because we had a lot of wall space. Yeah. Um, and that like bottom 20, bottom 30 is is in the warm-up zone. But they were all so much fun. And I, you know, as a tall guy, I hate setting for kids. It's really difficult for me. Um, But it was just so, um, so freeing to set really fun, easy stuff uh, without having to worry about the the height thing. That was like, I had so much fun setting that event. Some of the, like my favorite boulders I've ever set are from that event. And that was like six years ago or whatever. It's it's funny you say that, but I definitely got the reaction from a lot of setters because I think you're right. You do take away some of those constraints that you're worried about. And it's, it's really really fun when you get to set a whole bunch of problems for somebody who's never climbed who's never competed before like these people are renting climbing shoes they don't know what competition climbing is and it's really neat to be able to set them up in a way that they can find out what it's like and also have a really good time doing it and maybe come away with some sweet swag so i have to ask about uh a few events in you guys introduced uh, well, I guess with context, your first few events, they were scramble events. So like 40 yeah. to 60 problems, I guess. Uh, and so for the individuals, obviously it was just tally, I think the top six climbs. How did you award team, uh, 
prize, uh, like team awards for uh, those original scramble comps? Super, I mean, super great question. That was like the big thing that we had coming in is how do you, it's such an individualistic sport. How do you create this like team scoring system? But what we just decided was we would take the, uh, like most scramble formats, take the six top scorers um, from the six top athletes, male and female. And so, um, and so we'd add their scores together. Um, So what we, you could have a cumulative team score. You didn't, you didn't need three people, like three men or three women uh, on your team to be a team. Um, we would just add those scores together. So some teams have like 20 people on them, but we'd only take the top six scores through. Some schools like Poor Jake Tiger was like the only one competing from OCAD the entire time. <laughs> and so there was just Jake Tiger. Um, so that's where the, I mean, the downfall of the group competition is if you don't have people to back you up, you don't have much of like a team competition going on but what we did eventually create was a team finals uh which took a lot of conceptual um slogging to get it to work out and make any kind of sense um because you know how on earth do you have a team competition and cumulative scoring makes sense uh so that i think was our biggest thing and so we decided that that was far too much to deal with on a regular comp basis like chord box awesome if you just had scramble format every time it would be really easy but having a finals makes it a lot of work and so we figured if we're gonna add in finals we're gonna do it at a season end um and we didn't want it because there's so many athletes we didn't want it to be a cumulative thing across the season like you had to qualify for it um so we just allowed anybody to come to our finals but what we did is we did tally those scores like we did every comp and instead of just giving prizes we then took those athletes into a finals okay so i was at a youth local in uh kitchener and uh, Liz, who I worked with at the time and who had previously been the president of the McMaster Climbing Club, she was convinced that we had to go to Guelph Grotto that same day to watch these team finals. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know anything about them. I just knew they were going to happen. So we drove down the road to Guelph. I was just kind of hanging out. Um, but I, you know, I go to a lot of comps. I love them. And they're usually like pretty full of psyched spectators but this crowd was ridiculous it was a small gym but it was packed full of people they were all cheering for their own like uh 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 what, what is the word co-students Team? peers peers yeah <laughs> teammates um uh but the the format was incredible. I hung around and watched, and I had so much fun watching it. I took some pictures and stuff. And so I need you to explain uh, how that finals works. As complex as it might be, I need you yeah. to try and break it down. I'm I'm gonna do my best. Um, so it's really interesting. Uh, one of the things we wanted is we wanted a finals that was super engaging. So um, there's a lot to be said for the style where you have one athlete on the wall and you're watching them because they get all the attention and that's really nice that way. But our competition wasn't about individuals, it was about teams. And so our goal was to have as many people on the wall as possible, which I think adds to that intensity of our finals. But the way that it works is, again, we tally top three men and top three women. Uh, and so we would take those top three athletes from the top three schools in. So if you're doing the numbers here, that's nine men, nine women. Um, And we had three finals problems, so slightly different again from most finals. But the way that it worked is we created a system where all third place athletes are going to stand up. You qualified in third place, and you're going to be able to stand in front of the problem that you're going to be climbing. These are not like tarped off or blind or anything, because again, this is about cumulative knowledge here so third place you're standing in front of the climb they're going to get the most amount of time to attempt their problem so i think what we did was we probably started with four minutes um so we said four minutes as many attempts as you want you want to get to the top of this climb but the all third place climbers are going together three men three women on the wall pretty exciting to watch that runs down when they come off the wall when their four minutes is up the next folks stand up, all the people in second place, they're going to stand in front of the same problems, but they're going to get slightly less time to do the problem. So they're going to get three and a half minutes to attempt it as many times as they want, trying to get to the top. When they're done, we end that, and all the first place individuals stand up, and they're going to stand in front of their problem, and now all of a sudden, they only have three minutes to attempt the problem. 
So what we've done is we've gone through the problem and now athletes are standing there, they're brushing for each other, they're cheering. But the way that it's designed is if you qualify into third place, you get more time to attempt the problem. And the idea also being that if you're the first place athlete, you're going to help coach these like third and second place athletes through the problem because you can talk to them, give them beta. And then when it comes down to you doing the problem, being the first place athlete, the hope is that with the knowledge that you secured and your skills that you might potentially be able to flash the climb or at least do really well on it. Um, and we are also, we're doing the four plus rule. So if you're still on the wall when the buzzer ends, you can still... Fin attempt to finish that problem which led to some like showstopper highlight reel finishes on problems which was great but that was the concept that you had a reduced amount of time to attempt the problem in uh depending on what place you qualified in but what that also meant was you had more time to observe the problem and interestingly enough it ended up being a really great like way to normalize across the ability levels in the teams because we sometimes had athletes from our beginner categories competing in finals. So although the setting could be really, really fun in a scramble format, it made it incredibly challenging for a finals format for a comp. Because we definitely had one year where we had a team where there were two beginner athletes and an open athlete against a team that had three open athletes in it and so the problems that we created were very similar to a U style comp where you had to have uh, an, a difficulty level that increased over the problem so some finals problems would start as low as v2 uh, but maybe end at v7 or 8 so that you could get you could split up that range of climbers across the climb and for scoring we would do points per hold um, because it was just the easy, and we'd box them out and put big numbers on it also so that the crowd could see and somewhat understand better how that scoring was working. And then we also, we would have judges per problem to count attempts in case it came back to count backs. But for the most part, when you get that difference of ability levels across nine different athletes, it tends to work out pretty well. And we never had a tie in any of our finals that we ran, which was really cool to see. And and just to, to finish illustrating it, so you had three three teams, uh, three men and three women on each, right? So each team Correct. was from a different school. All the men's climbs went first, and all the women's climbs went after, if I remember right. Um, but you had uh, each team was climbing at the same time, just on one of the different problems. So team, you know, a team from you. Know, U of T was on problem number one, team from Waterloo was on two, and team from Guelph yeah. was on three. So you had all three teams going at once. Uh, so logistically, it it was like action-packed. It was a really good time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it moved things along because you talk about the format you just mentioned. You're dealing with like, you know, 14 minutes of problem-ish, if I get, or no, like 10 or 11 minutes. Per yeah, 11-ish minutes, I think, something. Yeah. So it's fast, right? Yeah, so it could have stretched out if you, if you, you know, forced it one problem at a time. But because each team was active all the time, it, uh, it really flew. And I, I remember just uh not having much time to like sit and relax i was i think i was up with emma on top of the wall um and yeah it was uh it was just such a like excellent format considering the audience you had and the climbers you had yeah. i remember thing i guess i didn't mention sorry to interrupt is that of course with three problems once one problem was finished we'd rotate through the problems yeah. so every athlete every team got a chance to be on all three problems um but yeah definitely it, it made it pretty busy depending on the facility we're in so some one year we did men and then women we rotated maybe back and forth and then luckily enough we ended up in facilities where we could run all of them at the same time and my goodness is that an intense show when everybody's <laughs> on the wall at the same time for yeah. sure i i guess the only thing i wanted to mention was that i was i had heard about this format before I got to see it and I was extremely skeptical. Um, I had never seen a team finals that I had liked. Uh, and after being there, I was really impressed by the format. And so anybody that's listening, I just heard your description and is like, that's impossible. I vouch for it completely. I had so much fun watching it. I don't know if you've changed your <laughs> mind since then, um, but I thought it was excellent. It was such a good Not choice. at all. I have not changed my mind. I honestly, thinking about it, it was one of the most exciting elements to the UBS. And I, it was a lot of work leading up to it, uh, but it was so worth it. And just to see that reaction from everybody, and it really was... 
I think that um, encapsulated like what we were going for. We wanted people cheering for their teams. And it was so many times you would see that first place athlete actually giving somebody useful beta and getting that third place athlete through a climb or at least to the next bonus hold. Um, and then you and then vice versa, you'd see those, you know, the third place people brushing the crap out of that hold. So that first place person would get the the send on it. it. It was amazing to see. And I would love to I'd love to even attempt to run a competition series that would just be like team competition series. That would be a goal one day. Everybody talks about that team comp that happened at Rockheads years and years ago. Um, oh, what was that called? Uh, I don't know, header? The, uh, something like that, but the ad just surfaced. Uh, I think Rocket <laughs> just, uh, shared it again. Absolutely outrageous. We have to make that happen again. I would totally volunteer myself. To, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'd volunteer myself to help out with that comp, whoever's listening. Oh, no, we're putting a team together. We got to put oh, a team yeah, yeah. <laughs> The hurt bags. Yes, exactly. It'll be excellent. <laughs> um, so a couple more questions and yeah. a big one was about sponsors and sponsorship. Uh, you mentioned already that this demographic of university students is a really attractive demographic for businesses. Um, mm -hmm. But as a series, did you guys feel uh, attractive to sponsors? Did you have the success with sponsors that you were hoping for? It's hard. I think anybody out there who's organized a comp or has looked for sponsorship for a team or an athlete knows it's very difficult. And because it's becoming that world is becoming ever more commercialized. I mean, there's individuals that are seeking sponsorship for their Instagram accounts these days, but we were at the point where social media was just kind of rolling and we were starting to like, people were responding to us. We would send out a sponsorship package. I think I shared it with you. So it would be like, these these are the levels of commitment we're looking for. So we want, like, you know, you can give out swag at a comp. You can give out cash, which will go to cash prizes. You could, you know, do whatever you want. And we had really interesting reactions and support over the years. We were very lucky early on to get... Um, outstanding support from some small companies like Outland Adventure Gear. I have to mention Ray Brandt. He was honestly instrumental in helping us get the series off the ground. He provided some phenomenal prizes and honestly over the years was one of the very few to give us cash sponsorship as well. Uh, again, anybody who's listening knows how difficult that is. Um, but to be able to sweeten your uh, competition advertising package by saying, hey, we're giving away this much cash or we're giving away this thing, it's really cool. But it, we started getting reactions from people saying, well, how, what's your viewership on this platform? You know, How many views is your YouTube channel getting, which we didn't even have at the time? Um, and all of a sudden, when you start venturing out looking for sponsorship you're like oh we really should have thought more about what we're doing and where this is going because if you're going to be asking for money and things from people they want to see what they're going to get out of it and sometimes that can be hard to demonstrate if you don't know exactly how you're going to give it back to people but at a point where you're organized enough to say okay well in the week leading up to the comp we were off we were essentially offering like uh, takeovers like people do with Instagram these days so it's you know, like if you're going to be our sponsor and Blur was one of our amazing sponsors in the early days um, you know you're going to get three posts in the week leading up you're going to get two on the day of and you're going to get two thank yous you're going to get it on your choice of social media and then a bonus on one other platform or whatever and we had to start creating these packages and luckily I also had some experience with the first youth bouldering nationals at Climbers Rock um, pulling in sponsorship but it's difficult it hasn't got easier um it will always be a challenge of events like this because um i think at a point there's certain expectations when people go to competitions like this that even if you don't win you might come away with something some kind of door prize or swag um but I don't really know how you demonstrate the value of those things necessarily to companies. It's a, it's a fine line that you walk for sure. Uh, but as I said, we were very lucky to have the support of MEC in the early days, uh, Outland Adventure Gear, um, Blur, uh, Petzl came on early with a bunch of stuff. So yeah, very, very lucky to have that support. And then of course, local gyms would always do their best to throw in a little, little bit here and there. 
Uh, do you have any parting words for, for anybody, you know, out in, in the middle of Kansas or out in Manitoba, down in Florida, who wants to start, you know, maybe a small comp series, maybe a big comp series, anything you want to say to those people that are considering something like this right now? I do. Um, honestly, I think the best advice that I can give people is to take advantage of the incredible care and volunteerism that we have in the climbing community. The UBS owes everything to those people that volunteer their time to come out and judge, to help set problems, to clean holds, to do advertising, whatever it is, rely on those volunteers, the people that really care for you. It is an incredible resource and don't overlook it. And if anybody ever has any questions about how to maybe help get these things off the ground, or I, and I'm also happy to share my documents as well. That PDF was designed to be shared for gyms. I've even shared it with students for like high school projects and things like that. Um, if people are there, I would love to be there as a resource because uh, if you want to do it, I'm sure you can make it happen. Cool, man. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. It was great, uh, great connecting with you again, man. Always good to talk to you. Thanks for the time. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Max Summerly for answering my questions. And thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this episode, please leave a review on your podcast app or consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plastic weekly. I love mailing stickers out to new donors each month, so I hope I'll see your name on my list. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including the impeccable UBS handbook for host gyms. Seriously, you got to check it out. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at plasticweekly.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to tyler at plasticweekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend, including at U.S. Divisionals, at the Calgary Climbing Center, and at Blockbuster, which you should watch. 6.30 p.m. Eastern, Saturday. Join me. All right. Talk to you next week.